another hand to Sharon and the trio. Sharon and I go back, I don't know how many years, we both sang at Glide for the Glide Ensemble at the same time. Yeah, it's been a long, long time. The last time I spoke here, there was a lot of stuff going on in the world. <laughs> and here I am again. We've been a part of the largest election year in world history. And it's not just us. With more than 60 countries representing half of the world's population, 4 billion people, voting in presidential, legislative, and local elections. And those elections range from the massive. There's India's multi-day legislative election that's the largest in the world. There's Indonesia's presidential poll. It's the world's largest single-day vote. And there's tiny North Macedonia's presidential election. And then there's here. In this nation, we reflect a microcosm of the world and its beliefs. I just spoke at a conference of educators, an international conference, um, people from all over the world who believe in education for peace. And I grounded myself with my prayer chaplain and said, pray for me. Because we were positioned in a state, Georgia, that has a law on the books that if you are standing in line to vote, you cannot have someone give you a glass of water or you cannot vote. It had just been passed before I got there. And it's also a state that bans teaching accurate history and social justice to children. And, and yet, I was speaking to, I was the keynote there, and I was speaking to people from all walks of life, from all religious um, beliefs, um, from many different cultures and continents. And at one point after the keynote was over, a group of people came up on the right who were Israeli, and two people on the left who were um, Palestinian. And what I noticed was that they were all crying, and the people on the other side said, we didn't know whether or not it would be safe for us to be here. And so we had decided that we were gonna come for the beginning and get a sense of the landscape, and if it didn't feel safe, we were gonna go. And within a few minutes, we realized that we could stay. But as they were saying that, the two Palestinian people on the other side said, same here. And so I just stepped back and I said, here you go, here you go. You got a, a story here. And I came home this week with those who have found themselves amid a large range of emotions, some hopeful, or relieved, others frustrated and disappointed. And I wanna say that how you are feeling, regardless of where it is, is valid. And that's a hard piece to say, but it's valid for you. Because, because we all have a myriad of feelings that are ours. And the hardest work is when it's hard on your side to validate someone else's right to have those feelings, but that's what we're about too. So either this talk is going to touch you or you're gonna kick me out the door. <laughs> but I also believe that what, what we do is very important right now. And I believe that there is a work that we're called to do. And if we didn't know it before, we know it now. 
When I was about 10 or 11, I um, remember getting punched in the face by a little girl. And I lived on one of the highest streets in San Francisco, so I went running down the hill to my mom, and she opened the door, and I was crying. And I was, I was a nice kid. I never yelled. I never fussed at anybody. And out of nowhere, she just punched me in the face. And so I went to my mom, and I said, I got beat up. And my mom said, are you okay? And I said, I got beat up. And she said, are you still standing? And I said, yes. And she said, are you still breathing? And I said, yes. And she said, then wipe your face and go back out there. And I remember sharing that with someone who said, how could your mother say something like that to you? Um, and I said, you know, I think when you have the history that many disenfranchised people have had for a long time, it's the best message that she could have given me to say, don't live in the hole. Don't stay in your misery. Get up and go back out. I love the words of Keelan Harkin. It's when the earth shakes and foundations crumble that our light is called to rise up. It's when everything falls away and shakes us to the core and awakens our hidden ghosts that we dig deeper to find one inaccessible strength. It's in times when division is fierce that we reach for each other and hold each other much, much tighter. Do not fall away now. That's what my mother was saying. Do not fall away now. This is the time to rise. Your light is being summoned. Your integrity is being tested that it may stand more tall. There is a man named John Powell who is a part of the Belonging Institute at my graduate school, UC Berkeley. And John Powell says that there are three stories of how we can be in the world. And I'm going to be so bold as to challenge him. Um, and I believe that for some people, it's how they choose to be in the world. And I also believe that for other people, they're co-opted, that they lose their identity and how they are and the choices they make are then shaped by the identity of others. And that happens more when the other is more powerful, seemingly more powerful, that people lose who they are and give it up to someone else. So John Powell says that there, there are these three stories, and the first story that people buy into is that nothing is ever going to change. No matter what we do, um, that things are always going to stay the same. The second story is that we're heading toward a future where things are going to be horrific. If we don't do something quick and probably something extreme and something horrible back, it's going to be too late. And in the second story, it is as though they are always threatening us. And I think that when we lose our grounding, if we ground in what we perceive is coming at us and that we have to do to them before they do it to us, we will constantly be a people up in arms on a losing streak, feeling that unless we buy into this strange answer, it's us against them. I want to submit that the second story is a separation story. And we can end up being really engulfed by separation stories that frame how we respond out of fear. It's like separation of mind and body where we feel like we have to give up our body. Separation from humans, from what is divine, when we forget that the divine is us. Separation of people and planet as though we own the planet rather than we have a responsibility to the planet. Separation of those who are classified by one color against people who are of another color. Separation of those who believe one way 
or no way against others who believe differently. And historically, when we force separation, which is segregation, the, then we are emotionally lynch others. Stay with me. Because we allow ourselves to feel separate, and that separate is, separation is caused by or gives way to fear. And that fear leads to domination, or this need to dominate because we dominate the things that we don't understand. We dominate the things that we haven't found out about. We get scared and we wanna remove it. That fear leading to domination sometimes comes in the forms of laws and rules. The late comedian Richard Pryor said in a serious skit, very few serious skits that he's given, he uh, is a man who ends up being tried for something that he didn't do and convicted, and he says to the judge, you've taken away my job, you've taken away my home, you've taken away my family, is there anything else that you're going to take away? And the judge says, do you have any dreams? John Powell says that there's also a third story, one that is also about change, where the change is good. In this story, maybe we will have a more diverse and be a more connected people. Maybe we will learn to listen to each other. Maybe we will work together to create structures in which we can all participate, celebrating our differences instead of pretending that we're all the same. Let me be so bold as to say that coming out of this past week and facing the next four years, I submit that we need another story. We need a fourth story, a story that is even more radical than number three, a story of radical gratitude and radical belonging. And in the midst of all of the division, the hatred, the confusion, the warring, the rhetoric, and the domination, and the fear-based laws, we have as our call to teach, to model, and to live radical gratitude and radical belonging for ourselves and for the world. So I submit that there is a fourth story one that I hope we can hold on to, one that encompasses our vulnerability as people, our humility as people, and our understanding and our honor of all of us, each of us as people. In, I'm talking and I'm not paying attention to these slides at all. <laughs> in Montessori education, there is a series of learning that is called periods. At the very introductory stage of learning, we call it first period. And first period is when you introduce a new concept, you name it, you identify it. So this is the Chinese character for love. And in Montessori, in first period, you would say, this is love. This is the Chinese character for belonging. And so in Montessori education, you would say, this is belonging, and that would be first period. But in order for the brain to actually learn something, you have to mix it around in your head for a little while. You have to practice it. Like you, you don't get proficient at tennis unless you go out and you practice a lot. You don't get proficient at bowling unless you go out and practice a lot, or math unless you do it a lot. And when you get to what we call third period, it's when you know it, when you stand in it, when you're certain about it. And so when you say to a child, 
what is this? The child, because they've practiced and practiced and practiced and gone back and forth to identify what these things are, when you get to third period and you say, what is this? Then you know this is and you know this is very good. <laughs> well, in the journey of life, where we're still trying to learn how to honor each other, how to appreciate each other, how to treat each other with respect, how to honor our differences, we live life in second period. We're still trying it. We're still working on it. We're still figuring it out, but we can't expect perfection for each other, from each other, and we can't expect each other to believe the things that we do. What we have to do is to work at being able to make this space the best space possible, understanding that there are people who may not believe the same thing that we do which means that we don't go so low as to blame or shame or name call because that's not living into our highest self. We don't point fingers. We don't waste time putting our mistakes on blast. We don't spend time determining what should have happened, what could have happened, what was too late, what was too early because we're all people living life in second period. Clarissa Pinkola Estes, I, I love her writing, says, the fact is we were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, being in training for, and just waiting to meet on this plane of engagement. So in my fourth story, we're gracious enough to allow for mistakes because that's the growth that happens in second period. And we're grateful for the lesson learning opportunity that second period learning, living provides us. And then we rise. So in this new story, we recognize that our work is not to make people us. That's too much of what's already happening out there. It's not that we make others wrong because they don't see the way we see. It's where we seek to value the differences in each other, to live in the question, and to hold each other up as we are with those differences. Where we recognize that our differences make us the people that we are, and knowing that, that we also stand up and we never create laws or rules that cause us to forfeit our identity or our humanity. That we see each other as world citizens with neighbors to the north and neighbors to the south and neighbors to the east and neighbors to the west. and we hold a circle of human concern where everyone, everyone is in the circle. Where no one is better, where no one has more rights, where no one is wronged for who they are, where they live, what they believe, or who they love where we can see each other as harmony without uniformity, where we seek to find our common thread, a story that recognizes that we all bleed the same. In Zulu, there is a greeting phrase, which is called sabubona. Say that, that's your... Lesson of the day, sawubona. And sawubona means we see you. Some people translate it as I see you, which is not what it is. It's we see you. And then when you say sawubona to someone, they then can respond, yebo sawabona, which means yes, and I see you too. 
But the we has to do with your family lineage. Everything and everyone that has come before. And so when you look at someone, rather than looking past them or at them and just kind of saying hi, you look them in the eye and you say, Sawubona, meaning everything that I am, all of my lineage, all of my ancestors, everything sees you. And we see you as the total person that you are. And then when the person answers back, Yebo Sawabona, they say, yes, and everything that I am sees all that you are. I acknowledge you. I bring you into my existence because you are worthy of that. We see you. And if that's how we viewed each other, what if? What if we could see each other, Israeli and Palestinian, Russian and Ukrainian, Muslim and Jewish, far religiously right and liberally left, gay, bi, trans, straight, gender non-conforming, male, female. What if we saw each other as the people that we have been waiting for, as the people for whom we make way for the common thread that binds us? as the people that we are collectively grateful for? What if we discovered that that was the story? Could we tell that story? Could we live in collective gratitude for that story? Could we dream that story? Could we vote for that story? Could we be that story? It might mean being willing to reach across a personal or societal divide to try to find common ground, a way forward together, embracing our collective strength, reminding ourselves that we are better together than apart. Kindness and gratitude can open doors to connections that we might otherwise miss. And ultimately, that builds community. And if we can't go there, here's the hard part. If you can't go there, if, if the person that you are, the belief systems that you have cannot go there, you need to check that. If our unity principles and the God who we are within is misaligned or at odds with our personal beliefs or our political beliefs, now's the time to check that. Because we are a people grounded in love, living out love and justice in our values, seeing the God in each of us and no less. And this is the time when we need to stand for what we believe. Unity Ministries issued this statement in part. It says, whereas our second principle states, human beings have a spark of divinity within them, the Christ spirit within. Their very essence is of God. Be it resolved that based on Unity's fifth principle of taking action, which states knowing and understanding the laws of life, also called truth, is not enough. A person must live the truth that he or she knows, we commit to the following actions. To reflect on an ongoing basis, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our Unity Worldwide Ministry Board of Trustees. To ongoing, robust, mandatory staff leadership development and education committed to building a culturally competent, anti-racist community of leaders and allies. 
with ongoing training and education that positions Unity Worldwide Ministries to be on the leading edge of building consciously awake thought leaders committed to dismantling systemic racism and building a beloved community. So if you had another view, and you have a right to your view, you have even harder work to couple that view with the need to see the God in each and every person, and to ask yourself if the God in them, the God who they are, is being oppressed. And if the answer is yes, then you are called to have to stand with them, by them, and for them for justice and no less. As James Baldwin said, we can disagree and still love each other. We can agree to disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and very right to exist. Whatever we believe, we know, we know that we have work to do as a people, actors on the world stage for love and peace. It's been said, I should probably catch myself up. <laughs> It's been said, but the love of people for people is a far more tender thing and so simple that it's universal. To love in this way is not the privilege of any especially prepared intellectual class, but lies within the reach of all. So how are we called to hold gratitude as collective practice? Clarissa Pinkola Estes says, ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. What is needed for dramatic change is the accumulation of acts, adding and adding and adding to and adding more, continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace but only a small, determined group of people who will not give up during the first, the second, or the hundredth gale. So we keep asking, how am I called to be? She put it simply, we are needed. That's what we know. We are challenged to be a people to each other to hold each other, to care for each other, to love each other, to stand up and stand by and stand with each other. During this period of gratitude, can we practice radical gratitude and radical belonging as collective practice? Can we be grateful for the courage to move forward regardless of the outcome of what appears to be before us. And to those people who have felt totally devastated this week, our spirits may be saddened or assaulted in the coming months by coarse and crude language. I've heard some of it already. Um, go back to picking cotton. And there could be open displays of violence or privilege or power, but don't sit in your grief. Move through it. Martin Luther King said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't walk, if you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you have to do, keep moving forward. History is steeped with examples of people who fought through the darkness. In the glow of candlelight, that defeat paves way for triumph. I can't tell you what that triumph means or what it would look like, but I can tell you that change takes time, 
And so it's not worth it, and you don't have time to stay in your grief. There have been stories of the conditions that Harriet Tubman had to go through when she was making, getting her freedom and making way for other people to have freedom. Escaping meant leaving family, heading into the unknown, bad weather, no food. There was constant threat of capture. So-called slave catchers and their dogs roamed both sides of the Mason-Dixon line and sometimes even took freed black people who were helping them and put them back into plantations where they would be whipped and beaten, branded, or killed. Those were hard times. And for some of us, right now is hard, unknown times. But what Harriet Tubman said was, if you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see torches in the woods, if they're shouting after you, don't ever stop. Keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, there are many who have fought in defense of freedom and justice, who didn't know what the future was going to hold and didn't know that the fight was so much bigger than they were. And whether they were around or not, they knew that it was important that they had to keep going. Susan B. Anthony fought for women's suffrage for 45 years. Eight years after that, the 19th Amendment occurred. It was proposed in 1878, but then it took another 42 years after that before white women were given the right to vote. Before and during the Civil Rights Movement, individuals fought for the end of segregation. Rosa Parks, Ruby Bridges, Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, Medgar Evers, Jack Greenberg, the Little Rock Nine Freedom Riders, John Lewis, Martin Luther King Jr., and on and on and on for decades and decades of discrimination, ridicule, and violence, defeat after defeat after defeat, outlawing segregation and Jim Crow laws. It took the Civil Rights Act of 1964, it was 99 years before that was passed. And Jim Crow laws, except one, was banned. And that was 345 years after Africans were taken from Africa to this continent. And that last Jim Crow law is still on the books. It was a part of legislation this past election, and it failed, and so it's still on the books. It was a piece that was kept when slavery ended that permits involuntary servitude if someone is convicted of a crime. And so the Jim Crow laws were designed to have crimes that were so easy for someone to break that they would end up in jail and be back in servitude. And that law is still here. The fact that these things are so enduring, I can't let you stay in sadness by saying it's okay to keep grieving. Grieve for a little bit, but get over it. You have models of people that have done this and who have been sad and who have grieved and who have had to move forward. Last week was a sign for people on all sides that the work is not done and it won't be done because democracy is dynamic and norms change and people change and they discover themselves and they recreate their identities and oppressed people keep fighting for who they are. So know who you are and stay grounded and be intentional. Stay steeped in gratitude and love because gratitude has healing elements and love, love is always the stronger force even when it doesn't seem like it. So you have to hold love and gratitude as collective practice. 
because we need to learn how to be grateful for each other now in a way that we may not have had to do a little while ago. This is a time in which what you do and how you do it will create and carve history. It's when the earth shakes and foundations crumble that our light is called to rise up. It's when everything falls away and shakes us to the core and awakens all of our hidden ghosts that we dig deeper to find once inaccessible strength. It's in times when division is fierce that we must reach for each other and hold each other ever tighter. Do not fall away now. This is the time to rise. Your light is being summoned. Your integrity is being tested that it may stand more tall. When everything collapses, we must find within us that which is indomitable. Rise and find your strength in your heart. Rise and find strength in each other. Burn through your devastation and make it your fuel. And say our affirmation with me. You want to get to it or should I? Bring forth your light. Now is not the time to be afraid of the dark. And I'm going to say it like my mama would say it, and I want you to say it like that. Now is not the time to be afraid of the dark. Now is not the time to be afraid of the dark. And so it is. <laughs> <laughs>